coming up today, giving the very best care to patients with Alzheimer's. One woman opens up about the raw, emotional next step in her father's journey. Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the Morning Medical Update. Alzheimer's disease can be terrifying for the person diagnosed, but also for their loved ones. More than 11 million Americans serve as caregivers for a friend or family member living with the disease. But what happens when someone with Alzheimer's needs care for their family they no longer can provide? Joining us to talk about that firsthand is Alexis Del Cid. She is our colleague here at the Medical News Network. Uh, she's also the host of All Things Heart, and she's my friend who has been very, very open about her dad's Alzheimer's disease so so glad to have you with and us. I want to hold your hand I know that's okay like... we can do that. let's just touch and get our energy going um, yeah. in fact I, I have to tell you Jim her dad Jim he's a common topic of conversation here in the office sometimes we laugh lately yeah. there have been some tears yeah. Um, yeah but we mix it all together we and we muddle through uh, her and her mom have had to make the brave step of moving Jim to a memory care facility something that I know you've been told would have to happen yeah and now the time has come so we're going to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that we're also joined by dr. Jeff Burns a neurologist and Alzheimer's specialist who leads the memory care clinic and co-directs the Alzheimer's disease research center at the University of Kansas Health System we are also joined by Michelle Needens who works with dr. Burns at the Alzheimer's disease research center and is the director of the Cognitive Care Network. We'll tell you what that is here in just a moment. She's also worked a lot with Alexis and her mom, and we'll, and we'll tell you how. So thank you all for being here with us uh, for this really important conversation. And to our viewers, start thinking of questions because trust me, nothing is off limits when it comes to Alexis. She's here to answer questions and she's here to help. So Alexis, let's talk about this big change. Move, uh, you moved Jim yeah. to a memory care facility. Um, Led what? just a week ago today. A week ago today. Yeah, and so it was, that was big and yeah. it's something you've been talking about really for the last couple of months mm -hmm. actually we had the date on the calendar i think right. in the office that that's yeah. the day you were going to be gone to, to make this move what were some of the factors that went into that decision well i would say and i have to th thank michelle for guiding my mom through this and we'll get to i'm sure michelle's roles in a bit but you played a huge role in making my mom feel safe in making this decision um so the biggest thing i think for my family was um my parents are, you know, almost 80, and my dad's incontinent, mm -hmm. and no one talks about that part. Uh, doctors do, but when someone's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, that's just something that happens, and it's not your fault, it's the disease. But it makes it very hard for a caregiver. My mom's got really bad arthritis. She was getting exhausted, and I was so afraid she'd be up all night with my dad. I was so afraid that one or both was gonna fall and she'd get hurt or she'd get sick. She was exhausted. She was only sleeping a couple hours a night. And my dad was only comfortable with my mom doing certain things for him. There's just certain things a dad, even though he's so unaware of things, certain things he knows he doesn't want his daughter doing. Yeah. I've had to, but I, he doesn't enjoy that, you know? Um, so my mom was talking to Michelle and Michelle had said something as if, you know, a lot of people would have done this a while ago. You've You've hung on and you've survived so long and you've done a great job taking care of Jim and now it's time for this next step. And um, my mom called me and we were crying and, uh, and then you have to figure out how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. But it's like something that you never think you're gonna do. When he was first diagnosed four years ago, we thought we're never gonna do that. You just naively think you're not gonna need that kind of help and everybody can band together and do this, but physically it's not safe and my dad needed also more social interaction. It's good for him to be around people and have that 24-hour care. So, so Michelle, it's just a process. Talk to us about how you work with Alexis and her mom, and how does a family decide together to make to make that big move? Yeah, the uh, decision in terms of transition into a facility is very individualized. So every family should understand that there is not an answer that fits everyone. Um, that it, 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 in essence you have been given a 5,000 piece puzzle and you've got to figure out how to put those puzzle pieces together and sometimes those puzzle pieces put, are put together in a way that indicates placement. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean in terms of what does the person with the disease need? So Alexis talks about that socialization piece. 
And uh, in all my years of talking with people who are diagnosed with the disease, uh, absent none, uh, they want their families to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it, you know, to some degree, when it gets to a point where the family becomes the caregiver instead of the wife or the daughter or the son, then we need to do something else because that re familial relationship needs to be preserved um, and that person needs to be honored. Preserved and honored. Oh, that's a good way to put it. That's a really good way of putting it. Dr. Burns, what does good memory care look like? Because that's the big question for people like Alexis and her mom is we want it to be good. We want it to be the best. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's uh, that's a hard thing, um, mm -hmm. but it needs you know a supportive environment um, is is really important with that's active and uh, yeah. and you know looking to meet the needs of the of uh, of that person, uh, but we really like an active environment that's you know helps stimulate the brain and keep people keep people going, um, and then a place with with well trained staff. It's really important. So you want people who kind of know how to react um, in in situations, uh, you know, when people have memory problems. So um, and it's really important that the family is is comfortable to some degree, right? I mean, it's it's a really hard move, and it can be hard to be comfortable with with moving somebody who's been at home their whole life to a new place. But trying to get comfortable with that with the place and get to know some of the folks there. Uh, Good advice, Michelle. Any other advice on how to make? the move as easy as possible for the patient and, and of course the family too. You know security and reassurance are the most important thing. So creating an environment where there's some familiarity and where there are what I consider to be security blankets. So security blankets are those things for all of us that we look to and there's some uh, there's some safety and there's some identity attached to it so uh, that people can say I'm okay here. So sometimes that's pictures, sometimes that's um, uh, uh, DVDs, sometimes that's blankets, sometimes that's chairs, whatever that is, there's a, you know, uh, but there needs to be security blankets in the room and there needs to be coaching really in terms of visiting and um, how to help with that transition for them and for you in terms of how long to stay and when to leave and all of those kinds of things. So Alexis, tell us about the security blankets you created for Jeb. Okay, so this was Michelle's idea. Um, she said make a list for the staff. I took your idea to like the nth degree. You, you might see this in, the, in some of the pictures. <laughs> you said create some lists so that uh, what, what we love about Jim Johnson and so I made these posters for my dad so he remembers. You, I want him to remember who he is and how loved he is, but I also want the staff to come in and know about my dad. I want them to see him as a complete person, and I know they do, but I want them to really feel it when they walk in. So I made a series of posters, what we love about him. Um, ask me about these cool things. Ask me about these things, and I have a list of things throughout his life that I want people to ask him about. And I put him in his bathroom, and I put him on another wall by his bed, so I picture the staff going in and, and oh, Jim, tell me about the time you, you know, whatever, a, a weird news story he covered. He was a newsman in Chicago for 45 years. Um, ask, me, ask me about my water skiing. And so I put all his water skiing things and pictures, and my dad loved it because he's always liked holding court and entertaining people and talking to people, and he loves talking. I mean, who doesn't like talking about themselves? He's, he's, he's fine with that. So I, I brought each staff member in and said, I want you to see how cool my dad is and what kind of guy that he was when he was his complete his complete self before this disease, and I want you to ask him because these memories are still brought to the surface. So his whole room's decorated with neon, different colors and posters and things. And how helpful was that for you to, to work on this project? So therapeutic, um, because my mom didn't really have the bandwidth to do it. She was so, my mom's, no one's been suffering more than my mom up through this, and she didn't have the bandwidth. So I said, give me all the poster supplies and let me go to town on this. So I just spent days making posters. And I just want to give a shout out to my mom because I'm able to talk about it and blog about it and do, do programs like this and make posters. But meanwhile, my mom's been in the trenches. I mean, she's just been doing the work 24 seven of watching her soulmate. I mean, they've been together since they were, she was 16 and he was 19. 
And so she, no one's in more pain than my mom and more tired than my mom. And I know that there are other people who are going through this. And if you're, even if you're on the peripheries, just so important to know what the person who's like in the thick of it, in the trenches is going through. Because you see me mm -hmm. sad, but wait, you haven't seen sad till you've seen my mom, right? Right. Um, You'll say things to me like, I'll go, how are you today? And you'll say, I'm just hanging by a thread. You yeah, know, white just, knuckling it. <laughs> you're just white knuckling and that's it like, the It's day. okay, as long as you just white knuckle it. And then I give you a zinger. Yeah, we make fun of each other, and that helps. And life gets It's back. our love language. It is our love language. <laughs> um, <laughs> another la language you've been uh, yeah. uh, using is your ability to write, and you're, you're a beautiful writer, by the way, and you have this, this blog. Uh, we want to put some information up so that people know how to find it, because it's really, really helpful. And just to kind of give people an idea of what it's like, you can go to alexisdelsid.wordpress.com. Uh, I love it because you just, you, you just go deep on these little bite-sized moments that happen mm -hmm. from day to day. And I'm yeah. sure Dr. Burns knows that everything is just kind of, it, it goes day to day. You know, one little thing can happen right. and, and you go deep. We'll talk more about that, but I want to just read a little piece because I've been reading them throughout the weekend. And you, you said, please read those before you, you see your dad on Father's Day. So you, not to make you sad, but I just want you to appreciate your dad. I know how I much did. you love him. I and, did. Yeah. I did it. And it, it really helped. So thank you. But you said this, since the moment we got the Alzheimer's diagnosis, this was the moment I had feared. I had nightmares about it, daymares about it, played it over in my head, anticipated, rehearsed it, dreaded it. I always envisioned that when this part would happen, I would collapse. I would simply fall to my knees and die. I would disintegrate. I simply could not imagine living after the moment and the moment was when your dad looked at you and said now who are you to me yeah and um that was one of the things i feared most i mean that's just what you fear the the i remember the weekend he was diagnosed i was pretty like catatonic it was four years ago and that was all i could think about was when that would happen and then when it happened as i write my heart kept beating i didn't die i didn't disintegrate i just said oh I think I said, uh, I'm your daughter, silly. Oh, right, right, right. And then I just, let's keep going. Like that was let's the moment. Let's just keep going. That was the moment. And then you realize, I said, oh, daddy, I'm your daughter. And I just didn't make a big deal out of it. And the moment was actually, I mean, it's bad, but not as bad as the, the um, well, I thought I would die. Mm. And you don't. You didn't die. No. You got I'm still it. here talking about it. You keep going and then you process it. And Alzheimer's, I think, is a moment to moment. I'm, and I'm stunned I'm able to say that part without crying. But then other little things will happen that will set you off, as I'm sure people going through it can relate to. Dr. Burns, how familiar does this sound when you talk to the families of, of Alzheimer's patients? Yeah, no, very. I mean, and you're saying it incredibly well and I'm proud of you for for, for speaking I want to hug it. you too I want to like I wish we were in like a huddle or on a couch so I could because you guys have been so helpful I mean just so supportive so go yeah. on sorry well no it's very familiar that you know you just got to take it one step at a time one day yeah. at a time and adapt um, and just keep moving forward and yeah your heart doesn't stop beating and your dad's heart didn't start stop beating and just got to keep going and make the most of it. And, I, and you are. And I think what helps Alexis with both of you is knowing someone like Dr. Burns is hard oh, at yes. work with the research oh, and, yes. and looking at things on the horizon that are going to change things for people down the road. Where are we with research? Uh, we're we're making progress. Um, we're making a lot of progress. It's been a you know a slow fight. Um, I've been at it for 20 years, but we're on the verge of new drugs, uh, which is a big deal. So we're, we're days away from a full approval of a, of a brand new drug. And um, it's not a cure, but it's a step forward. And so, you know, we're making progress. Well, and making progress may not have been something you would have said 20, 30 years ago. It was just that, that slow burn of when's that moment going to come. And now when we talk about the new medications that are going to help people, in what ways are some of these medications going to help people in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, in the, in the very near future, we'll be prescribing an, an additional drug beyond what we have right now um, that actually uh, is meaningfully slows the disease. Um, it's going to be for people in the really early, early stages, really mild, you know, symptoms, but, uh, but it slows things down. It doesn't cure people, and it doesn't stop it, but, um, but it's one, you know, step forward where we're we're actually, you know, and the way this drug works is it pulls amyloid out of the brain, which is something that builds up in the brain mm -hmm. of people with Alzheimer's. So 
Um, so we're able to now pull that out of the brain and it, and you know, it has an impact. We know we're going to have to have other approaches and other ways to, to go after this process. Um, so it's going to take more, but it's a big step forward. Michelle, you were going to say something. Oh, just in reaction to Alexa's story about uh, the day uh, Father asked her, I, th what's really important about that question is, who are you to me? Yeah. And to me indicates there was an awareness that you're somebody important. And I just think it's important for families to know love lives and feelings live through the disease course and labels are perhaps not so important. And so we grow as families, we grow as individuals. Um, uh, you know, we don't, we, we grow deeper through this process and there's something very significant. We pay attention to things we didn't before and we don't want to lose the lessons. Because in, in that moment, the loss. yeah, in that moment, I knew he knew he loved me. I know he loves me. I know he knows in his heart, I know he knows me. Mm -hmm. He just didn't know what I was to him. Yep. And he might not know my name. And there are sometimes I walk into his room and I don't even give him a chance to not, I don't want, I won't want him to worry and I don't want him to panic. So I walk into his room and I say, hi daddy, it's me, Alexis, your daughter. And I'll like do a tap dance. I do something silly or funny or my husband will walk in. I'll say, that's Salvador, your son-in-law. He laughs at all your jokes and oh yeah. You know, I just, I want him to be comfortable and I know he knows in his heart that he loves us. He just doesn't, the connections are getting all foggy now. But it's not a person, it's nothing personal. It's not like my true and complete dad would ever forget me. It's this disease. Yeah. It's the, and it's not his disease. I, I don't know where this fits, but I just wanted to say this. From the beginning, my mom and I said, it's not dad's Alzheimer's, it's the Alzheimer's. And I told my dad, I'm like, dad, you don't own this disease. It's not yours to own. It just picked a vehicle and it picked you. And for whatever reason, you're the vehicle in our family carrying the disease. We all have the disease, but it's not his. So if you have it, you don't own your disease. That makes sense. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. I want to talk about resources because I know they've been key for you and your mom. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, Michelle, about the Cognitive Care Network and the work you all do. So the Cognitive Care Network is, is uh, a program in which we really recognize that Alzheimer's and other dementias are complex and require more than a diagnosis and treatment. They, do, it, they hold within it all this emotional terrain and navigation of behaviors and mood and grief and all of those kind of things. So the Cognitive Care Network in the clinic is a team of social workers who work with families. In the larger community, we, we partner with many practices to build a architecture in their practices in which they uh, work to diagnose early and to introduce support and uh, counseling early on in the disease so that people are better prepared and have a chance to really um, process what they need to in this journey. Dr. Burns, a lot of times when we start this program we will talk about what is Alzheimer's or what is this type of cancer or what this type of tumor. Um, I did want to just end before we get to our community questions. It sounds like a simple thing but what is Alzheimer but what is going on specifically inside the brain yeah. that is making this happen. Right, well there's a lot of changes that are happening in the brain when somebody has Alzheimer's and two sort of hallmark changes that we've known a long time, over 100 years mm -hmm. exist, are the buildup of something called amyloid plaques in the brain which are little microscopic changes that we can see under the microscope and then something called neurofibrillary tangles, so plaques and tangles build up in the brain in Alzheimer's. There's other changes and it's really complex disease and that's why we're going to need drugs that go after multiple angles but uh, but that buildup of amyloid plaques and tangles is really really strongly linked with the decline that we see, the dementia which is the memory and thinking changes that are interfering with daily function. So, um, so those plaques and tangles are what we're targeting with our new approaches. Um, and specifically, these new drugs, lecanemab or lecembi, which is the one that will be in the news a lot here in the next few weeks, uh, goes after that amyloid and actually 
sort of tricks the immune system into pulling it out of the brain. Why is it so important though that it gets started early? Well, yeah, so the, the drug, that drug um, and the, the others like it have been tested in those in people with the early symptoms of the disease and it looks like its, it's impact is one where you know, we, we see the long-term benefits in people who have early symptoms. So it's not everything, but it's something. Yes, not a, it's not a cure. Um, and it doesn't stop it, but it is, but it looks like, you know, in its early days, but the data is, you know, uh, is really pointing to, in a lot of different directions, to a meaningful slowing of decline. By the time my dad was diagnosed, it was too late for that. Mm -hmm. And so we always go back, and you can always play the second guessing game. What if we made him go to the doctor sooner? But he never wanted to go to the doctor because it runs in our family. His mom had it, his sister had it, his grandpa had it, and so he would have these panic attacks and he'd make excuses and then we just would put off going to the doctor and I just wonder how early we would have had to have gone and we're looking like how how early do you have to catch it the first moment how do you uh, know yeah no it's, it's just gonna you know yeah, earlier is better I would yeah. say and I, I don't I wouldn't lose too much sleep yeah. over that but uh, because again it's not a cure uh, but earlier is probably the first few years where we're seeing symptoms is the, the window of opportunity it. for these drugs now. Yeah. And we may learn over time that, you know, in the middle or later stages, these drugs might be helpful. But right now, the data and our experience with it suggests that in the moderate to severe stages, we're not, we're not seeing a benefit. But, yeah. All right, be sure to ask your questions. You can use the chat on YouTube or Facebook. You can tweet us or email the Medical News Network. The info is right there on your screen. Let's get a quick check on our COVID count. Dr. Dana Hawkinson is out this week. So here are your numbers today. There are 17 total inpatients here at the health system, eight active cases, one patient in the ICU, zero on ventilators. Any reporters with us today? All right, let's get to some community questions. I'm gonna read something really nice. And some, uh, oh, Georgianne. She says, Alexis, I'm a Chicago nat native. Listen to WLS and Aww. just touching an informative program. Thank you for sharing. Um, Jean says, touching excellent, timely program today. Yen Liang, thank you for sharing. So oh, that's nice. So a lot of yeah. people kind of holding your hand this morning. I hope you feel the love. Yeah. So I have a question though that I wanted to ask you about, um, and you actually touched on it in your blog because you said, I, when when are people going to turn against me in the room? When are they going to be tired of hearing about my grief? Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> yeah. and you say that a lot. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys. Sorry, I'm talking about dad again. And we're like, it's okay, Alexis. We mm -hmm. got you. But um, a question is just how, how do you handle those conversations and help us to know the do's and don'ts of what to say to someone in your spot? Oh, okay. So, well, I think the best thing you can do is what, honestly, I'm so thankful to work here. Um, because Jess and Stu and Alex and Maggie and Logan and Cliff and Bob and Alan, like everyone, Jill, everyone in our office has been so kind about letting me talk about it. And that's the best thing you can do, I think. Everybody's wired differently, but if someone just wants to come and talk about their loved one, just to ask them questions about them or ask them what they were like, that's awesome. And I know everybody means well. I think if I was gonna say a don't, you know, we've had this, what would you say people don't do? And I wanna preface this by saying everybody means well. Nobody wants to make it worse, right? Nobody's gonna come up to you and say the absolute worst thing and want to say it. Mm -hmm. I think it's not that helpful for me personally or my mom when people would, when someone has Alzheimer's, you're already grieving and you're doing this pre-grief, you're, 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 you're grieving them while they're still living. And that's super creepy and weird and you feel guilty and you're laden with all these emotions because they're still here. So when people say, be grateful, be grateful they're still here, just be grateful, it makes you feel as if it doubled, you double down on your shame of feeling grief. Of, and it makes you feel like, gosh, I should be grateful. It just puts that more intense pressure when I think it's okay if you walk up to someone and say, gosh, this sucks. Of course you miss them, it's horrible. It's like they're not here anymore, yet they're still walking around in their body. It's weird, and I think to validate that is the most helpful thing you can do rather than telling someone to be grateful. But if you've said that to someone, you clearly meant well, so I don't want people to feel bad. All about the intent. Right. But if you really want to be helpful, kind of sit in it with them. Yeah. 
sit in the dirt with them. Yes, get it. yes. Georgianne wants to know the distinction, Dr. Burns, between Alzheimer's and dementia. You get that question a lot. Yep. Is there a big difference? Okay, yeah, the number one question we get. And um, <laughs> there is a difference. And uh, dementia is a really broad term that includes a lot of different things, including Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is a cause of dementia. And dementia means memory and thinking changes that interfere with daily function. And again, a lot of things can cause that. Alzheimer's is the number one cause. Probably two-thirds of dementia is related to those plaques and tangles that I mentioned earlier. That's what defines how we define Alzheimer's, the presence of plaques and tangles in the brain um, in somebody who has dementia. So dementia is the big umbrella in which Alzheimer's sits underneath. Yen Correct. Liang wants to know, is there a relationship between Alzheimer's disease and insulin resistance? What do we know about that? Um, yeah, so that's something that we've been you know, studying. That's a, our center, the research center, has a theme, and the theme is metabolism, and that's one of the things we've been studying. And so there is some relationship between insulin resistance and, and brain health and, and maybe even the plaques and tangles in the brain of Alzheimer's disease. And so we have a long way to go to really understand that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there is a relationship there. And one thing people say, well, what should I be, what should I do for myself? Well, you know, eat healthy, avoid diabetes. Um, and we think probably a low glycemic diet. And I say probably, but, uh, cause we haven't really proven this yet, but you know, something where you're not really stimulating a lot of high, high insulin or, you know, so a high sugar diet is probably not something that's great for your brain. Jeremy has a comment. He says, hi, Alexis. Not a question, but just encouragement since I'm going through the exact same thing with my mom. Yeah. The, he's just really happy that you're looking for ways to not take the tough parts personally and just reminding yourself about the love and support. Keep up the great work. You're doing a great job. And back to you, Jeremy. Honestly, that's just to share, just to share that you're going through it in a comment is huge because you're not isolating. And I think that's so important to keep talking about it or else you tend to isolate and that's the insidious part about this disease is that it makes the whole family isolate and circle the wagons and you've just got to fight that urge. I remember a year ago you invited me to your home and something came up I think with the kids and I couldn't make it over. You said, yeah, come over and see Jim, come over and see Jim. And then I think it was a few months later I said, hey, I want to come see Jim. And you go, uh, I'd rather you not. And it was yeah. like you want, and you go, I just, I want to protect him from people seeing him and he'll say something or he'll do something. And that I'm like, that might I'm, make you uncomfortable. Right. right. And I'm like, no, I'm there for it. Let's do it. It's okay. And, and that's and the disease. And you reminded me of that. Like, I slipped as much as I'm trying to not be isolated and thinking I'm blogging and expressing, there I was. Mm -hmm. And you all you know all about it. And so that's the disease. It, it's just an evil disease that affects the whole family. And thank you for pulling me out of that because. I did exactly what most people do, which is was starting to isolate. You let me FaceTime him though a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> and you fun. cracked a dirty joke of and he I did. loved it and he cracked one right back. I love it. That's my dad's love language as well. So um, but to keep pushing, you know, you did everything right there, and that's what honestly, if people are watching this and you're not affected by it, reach out to people. Don't let them. They're not <laughs> I wouldn't have been protecting my dad to keep him from you. I would have been isolating him and me, mm -hmm. right? So keep reaching out to people if they have it, even if the person says something strange or weird or whatever. You're helping the whole family by reaching out and just live in it. Things, weird things are going to be said and people are going to do things. You just keep marching through it. But you're helping the family by not letting them isolate and groundhog. I want to get to our takeaways today. Michelle, I'm going to start with you. What do you want folks to take away from this conversation? Uh, that there's a balance to, to grief and hope. Um, that you can find a pathway uh, uh, to move forward. That there are moments that shouldn't be missed. Uh, and absolutely agree that uh, we all need one another. and. And that includes the person with the disease, that includes the family, that we need a team, uh, just like we do with, with every other very difficult situation that life throws at us. Thank you for the work you're doing. Dr. Burns, uh, your takeaway, and also let people know if there's any trials that they can participate in. Yeah, I guess uh, I'm, I, I'd sum up sort of the state of the research as it, it's a whole new era for Alzheimer's disease, a whole new day for Alzheimer's disease research. And we're on the verge of new diagnostics where we can recognize the disease earlier and we're on the verge of new treatments. And I don't think it's a question of if we cure it, I think it's a question of when we cure it. Mm -hmm. um, it's coming. I wish it were sooner. I wish it were tomorrow. 
um, but uh, we're going to get there. It's uh, it's it's going to be a long, hard fight, and the way we do that is through trials. Mm -hmm. You know, we need volunteers for our uh, for the research studies. Um, and one way of thinking of that is the first person cured of Alzheimer's is, go is going to come through a, a research trial. Oh, man. Um, you and we've got, you know, we, we, you know, that's the number one thing that slows us down more than anything is finding volunteers for our research studies. So, um, so we need we need help. It's a community fight. It's a joint effort. Well, I love that if we were having this conversation several decades ago, you would be ending on a on a low note. So yeah. thank you for ending on a high note <laughs> and giving us hope because that's really that's the key. Alexis, my friend. Um, so you have this blog. Tell people again where it is, and I want to read one more piece from it because I just so it. it's alexisdelcid.wordpress.com. Okay, so my name .wordpress.com. And share it with people if you know people who could utilize this this resource. Just the personal raw. You're very raw yeah. about it. Um, I want to read something because this is. Um, what made me text you and say, I think you need to write a book. <laughs> and I, you've already them. written it, it's here. Just put it together and serve it up so people have it. But you said, my dad is leaving in pieces. So are the parts of my dad's mind that have already left just waiting for the rest of him on the other side? How does it work? I wish I knew. Are the parts of him we miss so desperately watching over us right now as we travel through this path with the other parts of him that remain behind? Does he feel fragmented? I wish I could pick up the phone and ask God. I would not ask why him. I would ask how does it work when the brain leaves first? Because I need to know that my dad will be complete again. Yeah, that was. Uh, sometimes I sit down to write, and if I'm scared to say something, then I know I need to write it. Like whatever I feel most protective of in me at that moment, I know I need to put down and just hit post. Um, just send it. Yeah, just send it out. And that's a big question because if you believe in heaven or another another plane, what's happening then? And I like to picture now, and what I truly believe now is that someone actually wrote this as a comment on Facebook when I posted that. So whoever wrote this, thank you. And that's why I love posting these things. Someone shared, I think your grandma is on the other side collecting pieces of him, waiting for the rest of him to get there. And that's how it works. So all your loved ones are there collecting the pieces and just waiting till he's there. Or sometimes I like to think that he's already there and he's watching me take care of him here. And I think that can be true too. Um, and that's what I like to, that's what I like to envision. Yeah. Lisa says, love you, love your family. Thanks for what you're doing for your dad. So people Thank are hearing you, you this morning. That's and we nice. did it. We texted we each did other. It. We called each other this morning. And we she, said, are she, goes, she goes, I'm kind of nervous. And I said, I'm kind of nervous too. And we've only been doing well, no, this for three decades you, together. You texted me and you're like, are you still coming? I'm like, well, yeah, I work there. I'm on my way into work. I'm still coming. All right, Dr. Burns, Michelle, you have to be happy that we just showed up today and that you two didn't have to do it on your own. Yeah. <laughs> but thank, thank you. you so much thank to the support you. from Dr. Yeah. Burns. And Michelle, thank you. Honestly, the first time my family talked to Michelle, she probably spent an hour on the phone with each of us and what you're doing for families and the hope you are providing to families with all the research and just knowing there's someone like you, Dr. Burns, fighting the fight of trying to find a cure and then we have Michelle holding our hands and guiding us like a true pro that you are through these big decisions is invaluable. It really is. Thank you thank to all you. of our guests and thank you to our viewers for your questions but also just sharing your own stories and your thoughts just this morning. We really appreciate it. Everyone, thanks for being with us and have a great day. We'll see you back here on Wednesday. Coming up Wednesday on Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Palliative care improves the quality of life for patients facing serious or life-threatening disease. Technology is fast becoming a part of that therapy. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Hear what the telemedicine revolution has meant for both doctors and patients, especially those who can't come into the hospital. Wednesday at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.